series of special lectures. Uh, we are very pleased to have with us uh, two members of the White House uh, community, two important uh, White House members. Ambassador Norman Eisen, who is, of course, you all know, the U.S. Ambassador to the Czech Republic, but before assuming this post, he actually was President Obama's special counsel in the White House. He is a very extremely accomplished uh, member of the legal profession in the United States and worldwide, and uh, has served in that capacity in the White House uh, during the financial crisis. In fact, uh, all the regulations were being uh, rethought, re-examined, and uh, new pieces were put together. So he's an accomplished member of the White House community. It's terrific for us to have him here. As you know, the U.S. ambassador traditionally over the last 20 plus years has been awarding the diplomas uh, to Sergei graduates. And it's wonderful to have him here in that capacity as well on an ongoing basis. He will be moderating the uh, uh, discussion today. And the other member, of course, of the White House community is Alan Kruger. I will let the ambassador introduce him. I will only say that uh, Alan and I go way back, in fact, way back where it's very painful for him, when he uh, took his first course in economics, economics 101, 102, sort of that sequence. I happened to teach that course for the first time in my career. So I came there, I knew nothing about teaching. It was a real torture for everyone in that class. And Alan got an A, he was the best student, but not only that, he actually became an economist. So he gets the medal for perseverance in the face of adversity. And so not only is he, of course, one of the most renowned and most exciting economists of our times, uh, but it's so wonderful, actually, that he became an economist despite what I did to him. Uh, so he's professionally damaged for life, but uh, he's doing quite well, all considered. So I will now turn to Stefan Jureida just to give you a little bit of a, a background on our relationship with the uh, U.S. Embassy, the special series, and so on. And then I'll let Professor introduce us. Well, thank you, Jan. Uh, I have just two uh, points to make in my role as Search Eye Director. The first one is to acknowledge the long-standing support of the, of the U.S. Embassy, which has been cooperating with Search Eye yeah. for 20 years now in providing U.S. delegation in Central and Eastern Europe uh, for the economists of the future of this region. And I also would like to advertise that uh, Professor Kruger's lecture today is part of a series of events we've been able to host and organize this year. Uh, starting, of course, with the 20th anniversary events, where we were lucky to, to have um, uh, Professor Stiglitz, uh, the 2001 Nobel Laureate, uh, discussing the, the future of macroeconomics. And after uh, you know, the, this fantastic lecture, we're very proud to have uh, Professor Kruger here, of course. We also have, um, on June 5th, uh, another major lecture uh, given by Christopher Sims, the 2011 Nobel Laureate. And uh, we also have Philippe Aguillon uh, of Harvard University coming in late June and Professor Milgram in the fall. The details will follow, so please stay tuned to our web pages. And uh, you know, I, I hope to welcome you here for some of these uh, major events. And of course, with Professor Kruger, our VIP lecture series just keeps getting better and better. Well, of all those uh, distinguished visitors, lecturers, uh, there's only one who is the President uh, of the United States uh, Chief Economics Advisor and meets with him every day uh, to uh, set the course of the world's uh, largest economy, and that is uh, Dr. Alan Krieger, who is my friend. Uh, who's uh, sitting next to me. He has excellent taste in his economics professors, not only because of the uh, purely accidental selection of Jan, who was a totally unknown quantity when you signed up for Economics 101. Uh, his uh, PhD advisor at Harvard uh, was uh, Larry Summers, so that was also a prescient selection. Of course, the two of us had the privilege of working every day uh, with Larry in the first days of the Obama administration. Alan, as most of you know, was the at that time the uh, chief economist of the Department of the Treasury, the Treasury Secretary's economics advisor, where he came to us from Princeton, uh, where he had uh, a 
um, has been a professor, had been a professor for more than 20 years, uh, and uh, established a reputation as one of America's uh, most brilliant, most prolific, and out of the box economic thinkers. Uh, beware what you bring up at lunch or dinner with Alan because it may turn into a paper uh, very promptly. Uh, the, um, uh, the, we had the pleasure of working together uh, on the financial regulatory reform and in those two crisis years uh, of the Obama administration, and they were uh, crisis years. We'll talk today about the reasons for confidence in the U.S. economy. Part of the reason that I have confidence is the U in the U.S. economy is because I saw Alan and our other colleagues firsthand uh, deal with the crisis uh, and uh, establish the reestablish the fundamentals uh, for the uh, U.S. economy to expand and grow. Um, so we're very privileged to have him. It's his second visit so far. We're looking forward to more. The, Alan and the President are tied as my two friends who have visited in Prague the most often. And I'm uh, very, very glad to welcome you to our, uh, to our beautiful city of Prague, Alan. Well, uh, thank you, Norm, for that very warm introduction. And uh, the same for Stefan and Jan. Um, you know. So what you missed was I said thank you very much for <laughs> Stefan for the very kind, uh, overly kind words. Um, you know, when I think back, whenever I see Jan, about how fortunate I've been in my education, uh, because when I started college, I expected to go to law school, uh, and my goal was to learn the skills to be a lawyer. Um, I'm so sorry you couldn't cut it. <laughs> and I realized that my comparative advantage was in economics. Um, my interests were in economics, uh, but how fortunate I was to have such great, great instructors. And there's so many events in one's life which are really luck. Um, and then it comes down to a matter of taking advantage of that luck. Um, and I'm sure that uh, all of you who are students at SIRGI uh, feel that way. But for me, throughout my career, it's been one series of fortunate events uh, which led to uh, outstanding teachers interesting research ideas, uh, wonderful collaborations, opportunities to examine new sources of data. Um, and uh, my advice uh, to the students is take advantage of the uh, fortunate opportunities that come your way. And there are, are many that you, you have for those uh, who keep their eyes open to them and, and uh, try to make the best of them. Um, I, uh, I, I first came to Surge I think it was 1993, and I was reminiscing that uh, I, I said that uh, I can come, it was the early days of search, yeah, I, uh, I can come and don't worry, Princeton can pay for my airplane ticket if you can just get me a hotel. Uh, I subsequently learned that was a mistake. <laughs> Randy Filer took advantage of this situation and found me a hotel which was formerly the Union Retreat on the edge of town. Uh, I had a room which didn't have a phone and didn't have a clock, and I needed to catch an early flight, so I asked for a wake-up call, which of course was impossible, and then somebody climbed up the flights of stairs and knocked on my door at 5.30 a.m. That was my wake-up call. Uh, as one indicator of how far Czech Republic has come and how far Sergei has come, I'm sure you now put your I guess up in proper hotels. Uh, I know when I serve. costumes are just like this. <laughs> um, actually, back then you could see uh, what a, a wonderful facility this would be, and what, a, what a fantastic institution it would turn into. Uh, and I've had the great pleasure of being able to stay with Norm and uh, his wife Lindsay and Dora Tamar uh, on this, which is my first official trip. I think both. I think that that Barack Obama is still ahead of me uh, since I made just one official trip that he has made two. Um, and it, it's uh, a, a great joy to work within the Obama administration, and really the source of the joy is the people you work with, the dedication of the people you work with, the, their, their uh, intelligence, their talent, uh, and uh, Norm and I worked very uh, closely the first couple of years as the administration was developing financial regulatory reform proposals. Uh, known as the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform Act, 
uh, it was uh, during the chaotic early days of the administration and really the most organized, rational process that I was part of uh, back in those days. And it, uh, I think, is viewed as a model for developing legislation within the administration. And a lot of the credit goes uh, to the input that Norm brought to this process. So it's uh, great uh, for me to uh, spend uh, some time with Norm again uh, this weekend. Um, the topic of my talk is reasons to be confident in the US economy. If you pick up the paper, what you see are uh, lots of comments about uh, uncertainty in the world economy, uncertainty in the U.S. economy, uh, and that's certainly uh, certainly the case. But I think people focus too much on the uncertainty uh, and not enough on uh, the opportunities that we have in the U.S. and in the world economy more generally. And in some respects, it reminds me a little bit of the feeling I had when I first came uh, to visit Prague in 1993, where there was a tremendous feeling of anticipation of uh, uncertainty about where things were going, uh, perhaps some cynicism, uh, but also a tremendous amount of optimism uh, that things uh, would be better. Uh, and I think it's clear that a tremendous amount of progress uh, has been made. Uh, and uh, that's actually how I feel about the U.S. economy right now. So let me give a brief report on how the recovery is going in the United States, how it's proceeded so far, uh, then uh, say some more words about uh, regulatory uncertainty, tax uncertainty uh, in the U.S., why I don't think that's been a barrier for our recovery, uh, and then uh, spend most of my time talking about reasons why I'm confident about the prospects for the U.S. economy in the near term and in the long term. Uh, the U.S. economy has been recovering from the worst recession we've had since the Great Depression. Uh, the president took office in January 2009. The recession officially ended in June 2009. That's shortly after the Recovery Act was put into place. We uh, have had 26 months in a row of job growth nearly three years of uh, economic growth. But while the economy is recovering, it is not fully recovered. The recession was extremely deep. Over 8 million jobs were lost. In the last 26 months, we gained 4.5 million private sector jobs. Uh, I think that's an impressive achievement, given some of the headwinds in the world economy uh, that the US uh, has been affected by. But we have a very long way to go. The president is committed to pursue policies to strengthen the, the economy in the short run and also return the US to a fiscally sustainable path in the intermediate and uh, longer run. And I think we see signs that the administration's economic strategy uh, has been working. In addition to what I mentioned before about uh, economic growth, uh, the growth has been led by the private sector. Uh, the last uh, uh, few quarters, we've had the federal government shrinking as the support from the Recovery Act phases out. Um, and the private sector has been leading our uh, recovery. The growth rate overall since the beginning of the recovery has been about 2.5%. But if we just look at the private components of GDP, it's closer to 3.5%. Um, which is rather remarkable because one of the drivers of economic recoveries in the U.S. has historically been the housing market. Yet because of the unique nature of the recession that we had, because we overbuilt so many homes in the bubble, the housing bubble in the late 1990s and earlier in the 2000s, home construction has been very weak. So the typical engine that fuels recoveries uh, has been weak and we've had to look elsewhere. One of the engines that's been fueling the recovery has been exports, and that has helped our manufacturing sector. Uh, and that was all part of the administration's strategy when we looked at the economic situation we were, we were beginning with. Uh, it was clear that uh, the U.S. was uh, over-leveraged, that consumers <coughs> were over-leveraged. Uh, we faced problems uh, that have been developing for many years, and middle-class income uh, had been stagnant uh, or declining. Uh, and Many families borrowed to keep up their consumption, 
So it was clear that we couldn't rely on the American consumer to generate the recovery. Um, and uh, at the same time, I think we had neglected our manufacturing sector. We had uh, lost uh, many jobs in manufacturing to competition from emerging markets. Uh, and that's beginning to reverse. Over the last 26 months, we've added almost a half a million manufacturing jobs. <coughs> and uh, I think that's very help healthy for the U.S. economy because manufacturing is a sector of the economy which employs relatively many unskilled workers and helps to provide them with jobs that uh, lead to middle class incomes. Um, the president uh, just uh, last week uh, proposed a checklist of activities for Congress to pursue to strengthen the economy. This checklist consists of five elements. Uh, support to help families refinance their mortgages. We have historically low interest rates in the U.S. now. There are administrative burdens which make it difficult for many families to refinance their mortgage. Typically in a recovery, interest rates are low. That's what helps to support the recovery. People can refinance the mortgage, get more disposable income, or buy a new home. What we're trying to do is to unclog that, that channel. We've done a number of steps to help uh, the housing market, to help uh, credit flow to responsible homeowners, to make it easier for people to refinance. There are limits to uh, how much we can do with existing legislative authority. So the president has proposed uh, some common sense measures to make it easier for families to refinance their mortgages. Uh, he has uh, proposed uh, tax uh, policy uh, to help small businesses. Uh, one of the ideas is rooted very firmly in the labor economics uh, that I learned when I took the Spaniards course many years ago, uh, which is uh, we should uh, lower the after cost, the after tax cost of hiring additional workers for companies. So the idea is if a company expands its payroll, we'll reduce the taxes on the additional payroll to give an incentive for expanding on the margin. Uh, so we're not just paying for activities that would have taken place. Uh, otherwise, the Congressional Budget Office uh, has concluded that this type of policy has the highest bang for the buck in terms of creating additional jobs uh, for the cost to the government. And the President has proposed, because we have limited resources, focusing this tax cut on small and medium, small and medium-sized companies. Uh, the President is also looking for ways to encourage reshoring companies to bring more jobs uh, back to the U.S. and uh, uh, we've looked at ways of providing tax incentives for companies that move uh, work back to the U.S. Uh, the fourth element of this checklist is a, a tax credit for uh, clean energy, uh, which was very successful and had expired. Uh, and then finally, uh, we are bringing more and more of our troops home, and our military will be downsizing. Uh, the President and the First Lady uh, have been uh, devoted to helping our veterans um, when uh, people leave the military, um, they often go through a transition period where they're looking for a job, uh, and uh, we're looking at uh, all types of ways to try to reduce the search time that's required for veterans uh, to find jobs. And uh, the president has proposed the Veterans Jobs Corps to give uh, state and local governments funds uh, so that they can hire returning veterans who have the skills to be first responders, ambulance drivers, and so on, uh, uh, to give them uh, jobs uh, right away when they, when they come back to the U.S. So these are some of the steps uh, that we're looking at to try to strengthen the recovery. Um, I think it's especially important that we get on the type of path that we were on in the early 1990s. That was the strongest period of job growth uh, in the U.S. in recent decades. Uh, it's also the last time that we had a budget surplus. Uh, I find it encouraging that if we look at private sector job growth, we're following the exact same path that we followed in the early 1990s. Um, and uh, I worked in the Clinton administration 1994, 1995, uh, which was at the beginning of this period. And people at that time felt that America is going to be different. We're not going to be able to regain the jobs that we uh, had lost. Uh, and we were actually at the beginning of uh, what was the most successful uh, decade for job growth, over 20 million jobs added uh, over the 90s. Uh, the 2000s, however, were a period of very weak job growth, even before the recession. The uh, recovery from 2001 to 2007 was the only recovery on record 
when a lower share of the U.S. population was employed at the end of the recovery uh, than was the case in the beginning of the recovery. Uh, so <laughs> we do face uh, problems that have been building for a while, which makes, uh, make, makes it even harder in, in the current recovery. Um, but I take heart in the fact that we're following a path that's pretty similar to uh, the uh, strong recovery that we had in the 1990s. Uh, so let me uh, next turn to uncertainty. Uh, one, of my, one of my heroes, uh, Bob Rubin, wrote a book uh, called In an Uncertain World. Uh, and it's certainly true that we have uncertainty. Um, but it's also true that we have to make decisions in the face of uncertainty. Um, and in fact, one of the collective illusions that led to the financial crisis uh, in uh, uh, 2008 was the mistaken belief that we had tamed the effects uh, of economic uncertainty and financial volatility. Many people were lulled into believing that risk and uncertainty were a thing of the past, like a quaint scene from a Frank Capra movie. But we rediscovered that random, unpredictable events are always possible. Now, as you know, economists have long recognized that risk and uncertainty are inherent features of the economic landscape. Indeed, economists like to think about different varieties of risk and uncertainty. Frank Knight explained uncertainty by distinguishing it from risk. He referred to risk as measurable, a known probability of an event occurring. An example is the chance of an accident being caused by a tire blowing out in a fleet of trucks over the course of a year. With enough data and experience, we can calculate this risk. Uncertainty, by contrast, in Knight's terminology, is immeasurable. It's an unknown chance of an extreme event occurring. We don't know what sets off fear and panic in financial markets. In the diamond dipping model, for example, you can have a bank run when there's no change in economic fundamentals, just a change in beliefs, which could occur uh, for any particular reason or no reason at all. As a consequence, it's not possible to calculate the odds of this type of an event occurring. One of the key advances of modern economics is that we can use the tools of economics and finance to reduce the consequences of both risk and uncertainty. These tools include insurance and portfolio diversification. For example, if you have home and auto insurance, that reduces your cost if a storm should knock a tree down on your front, front porch or on top of your car, something which happened to me uh, about seven months ago. Fortunately, it was my children's car. <laughs> And if you diversify your portfolio, that can help reduce the consequences of financial shocks. Uh, in the US, we saw this during the Enron debacle, where too many workers were insufficiently diversified. Their job security and financial security were needlessly bound together because they invested their retirement funds through their 401k savings plans in Enron stock. So when the Enron company went bankrupt, they lost not only their jobs, but also their life savings. Social insurance programs like Social Security, Medicare, and unemployment insurance provide another essential layer of protection against risk and uncertainty. Regulatory agencies also protect us against risk and uncertainty. The FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, in the US was established in the darkest hours of the Great Depression to reduce the consequences of bank runs. The FDIC for decades have, have, has helped to give investors confidence to save money in banks. By providing insurance in the event that a bank fails, depositors don't need to run for the exits when uncertainty is increased. The FDIC also limits bank failures through prudential regulation by limiting the types of risks that banks can take. Now, during the financial crisis, 
we use this type of a model in situations where it had not been applied before, most prominently to insure money market funds which were facing a run uh, at the end of 2008. Smart regulation can also help to contain the effects of uncertainty. The Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act of 2010, which I referred to earlier, requires systemically important financial institutions, what we call SIFIs, to hold more capital. Capital, <coughs> excuse me, capital acts like a buffer and helps to absorb losses. Capital helps to promote stability when adverse shocks should occur. And because our financial institutions were required to raise significant amounts of capital after the financial crisis at the beginning of the Obama administration, uh, they are now in a much better position to weather possible headwinds coming from the sovereign debt and financial crisis in the Eurozone. Now, while we live with uncertainty and try to contain its effects, it is also important to keep the effects of uncertainty in perspective. There are times when, as Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. I think this is one of those times. In the US, a number of commentators have claimed that uncertainty is holding back the US economy. They often assert with a great deal of confidence that an outburst of regulations and regulatory uncertainty more general are crushing job growth and hurting the economy. The evidence, however, suggests the opposite. According to an analysis by Bloomberg, there were more new regulations issued in the beginning of the Bush administration than in the comparable period of the Obama administration. Secondly, if regulatory uncertainty was hurting companies, it's hard to explain why corporate profits are at record levels in the US and why investment uh, has, been, has been strong in this recovery. Third, a former advisor to President Reagan recently pointed out that companies themselves rarely cite regulatory burdens as an explanation for why they lay off workers. Fourth, we should never lose sight of the fact that regulations that curb pollution and protect the safety and health of the American people are good for the economy and they improve our quality of life even if we don't directly count those benefits in our national income statistics. Then finally, we now have some modern measures of uncertainty. The VIX, uh, those of you who study finance uh, will know, it is a measure of uncertainty in our financial markets. And the, the VIX is down, in spite of recent problems in Europe, it is down considerably uh, from the highs that were reached in, in 2008 and early 2009. One of the dangers of exaggerating the effects of uncertainty is that it can paralyze action. The fact that we live in uncertain times should not prevent us from taking actions to build a better economy and a better future. I was reminded of this point by a recent conversation I had with Jeff Bezos. Bezos is the founder of Amazon. Bezos said to me, everybody asks me what's going to change in the future. And he said, that's a really interesting question, and we can speculate it all day long. But then he added, Nobody ever asks me what's going to stay the same. What can we expect to stay the same over the next 10 years, say? Then he pointed out, which I thought was quite insightful, when you think about what's going to stay the same, you can plan for it and make the appropriate investments. Bezos said that at Amazon, he was quite confident that customers would always want low prices, quick delivery, and wide variety. He said, it's impossible to envision a day when a customer would say, gee, that Amazon was great, but I wish they charged me more and delivered more slowly. <laughs> so he pointed out Amazon uses this quite sensible insight to invest to meet the demands that they anticipate will continue in the future. Uh, and that means, for example, investing heavily in their fulfillment centers. So ever since we had that conversation, I was thinking about I've been thinking about the U.S. economy in a similar light. 
you could say, yes, we know that there's uncertainty out there. Well, what can we be certain about? What can we be confident about? And I think that changes the, the discussion. It's a health, healthy way to think about an economy. I would encourage you to do the same uh, for the Czech Republic. Uh, so let me give you the list of seven significant items that I think we can be relatively confident that will continue in the US economy and that are sources for, of strength for our economy and I think have been important contributors for the strong, strong economy that the US has. First, the United States of America will continue to have a large free market economy that benefits from competition and easy entrance of new competitors. This applies to both product markets and labor markets. Creative destruction, as Schumpeter called it, is a hallmark of the American economy. It raises productivity and makes us more competitive in the global marketplace. Competition causes companies to be responsive to their customers, as Bezos emphasized, and to constantly innovate to stay ahead of the field. Competition also benefits workers by giving them opportunities to change jobs. This puts pressure on employers to retain their workers. One benefit of having a large market is that it is easier to specialize and take advantage of scale economies. If you visit a city and look up in the yellow pages and see how companies specialize, compare that to a suburb uh, where you don't see the types of companies and services that you can get in a city. Given the size, wealth, and competitiveness of the US markets, companies the world over will always have an incentive to develop new products and provide new services for the US economy. I like to paraphrase Frank Sinatra, if you can make it in America, you can make it anywhere. And I think this gives consumers and companies in the US a big advantage. Second, in spite of our problems, we have strong and stable legal and economic institutions that are capable of adapting with the times and circumstances, even though sometimes this appears messy from the outside as well as from the inside. These institutions have enabled us to build the largest economy in the world. There is no question that some of our financial regulatory institutions failed us during the housing bubble. There's also no question that we had large gaps in our financial regulatory system that allowed risk to build up in the shadow banking system. But in my view, there's no country that does a better job protecting savers' deposits than the US. We have an outstanding central bank which uh, has uh, well earned its independence. Our legal system does an excellent job protecting property rights and enforcing contracts. Uh, we strike an appropriate balance between protecting patents and promoting competition. And then if we look within the government, we have institutions that perform very well such as the Congressional Budget Office, which provides a nonpartisan evaluation of both parties' ta uh, uh, budget proposals, and the Joint Committee on Taxation, uh, which uh, does the same when it comes to tax proposals. Uh, and we have statistical uh, agencies, which have a tremendous amount of independence and uh, are uh, highly regarded and, and well respected for even handedly presenting the data that they collect. Faith in our fiscal, economic, and financial institutions is a key reason why the US continues to be a safe haven whenever uncertainty increases anywhere in the world. This is why the dollar continues to be the world's reserve currency. I think we can be confident that the US will continue to play this role in the foreseeable future. Third, the US is a, a, is a diverse country with a diversified economy. What do I mean by that? Well, high school textbooks will tell you a very simple, they, uh, simple story. They say that the US economy moved from being agrarian, agriculture economy, 
to being industrial during the 1800s, then uh, in, in, in the 1900s becoming an industrial powerhouse, then later in the 1900s became a service-oriented economy, and more recently, an ideas-oriented economy. But the truth is, we are all of those things. If you look at economic activity in the US, no major industry, which I define as two-digit industry, contributes more than 15% of our GDP. While agriculture, for example, has shrunk as a share of employment, our agricultural productivity was so high that agricultural output increased dramatically. And our agricultural techniques have become uh, a model for the rest of the world. A similar thing has happened in manufacturing. In fact, manufacturing is quite interesting because US manufacturing productivity has been very strong uh, uh, throughout the 20th century and so far in the 21st century. Manufacturing employment has declined for 50 years as a share of overall employment. However, from the 1960s to 2000, Manufacturing always provided about the same number of absolute jobs. We always stayed within a window of about 16 to 20 million manufacturing jobs. Manufacturing was very cyclical. When we would have a recession, manufacturing would fall sharply, but then bounce back and oscillate in the 16 to 20 million job window while the rest of the economy grew. Beginning in the early 2000s, something new happened in manufacturing. In the recovery, from 2000 to 2007, we lost nearly 3.5 million manufacturing jobs. So we fell outside of the 16 to 20 million window for the first time. Then uh, we lost another 2 million manufacturing jobs in the recession. Uh, around 5.5 million manufacturing jobs were lost in a decade. Now, it's much easier for a country to make a transition if the sector is staying stable and absolute terms and other sectors are growing to absorb workers who would otherwise go uh, into the stable sector. Um, our problems were magnified in the 2000s because of the decline in the manufacturing sector. <coughs> and, and this was something which was a, a, unusual uh, in, in US history. Uh, but it is the case that our manufacturing output continues to be quite strong. Uh, so even though we've moved to more of a service economy and more of a, an ideas economy, or recently I've heard the term app economy, uh, for apps for your iPhone or iPad, uh, we still are a manufacturing powerhouse. Uh, and uh, the president has proposed uh, a, a um, vigorous set of policies to strengthen our manufacturing sector. Uh, our problems would be much less had manufacturing retained five and a half million jobs that were lost over the last decade. The fourth item on my list, education will continue to be the most short path to success in, in, success in the US and around the world. And the US will continue to have what I modestly say is the best system of higher education in the world. That's not only my opinion, the Times of the Times Higher Education of London concluded that 30 of the world's top 50 universities are located in the United States. I don't think it's an accident that Sir GI is accredited by SUNY in New York State. US universities provide a model for higher education and for research. US universities attract hundreds of thousands of international students each year because there is no better place to study. Nearly 20% of all students worldwide who go abroad for a higher education enroll in the US. Stefan is an example, uh, and there are many, many others. Um, the number of students from abroad who enroll in the United States exceeds the combined total of the next two most popular destinations, which are the UK and Australia. Now, I think the US has something of an entrenched advantage. Let me explain what I mean by that. Research has found that most of the highest ranked universities in the US are all over 100 years old. If you go through the list of the top universities, they were all either land-grant institutions, which started 
uh, around the time of the Civil War, uh, or they preceded the Civil War and were as old as Harvard uh, or Princeton preceded the founding of the U.S. Really, the most notable exception, which kind of proves the rule, is Brandeis University. And Brandeis uh, is the exception because they were able to attract so many brilliant refugees during World War II. Uh, the lesson I take away from this fact is that it takes time to build a great university. Reputation is not built overnight. American universities are centers of research and innovation, and they are also places where students learn critical thinking skills that help them to succeed in a modern economy. I think the culture of openness and the ability to challenge old ideas in the US is one of the fundamental reasons why we have such a strong system of higher education. Uh, one of the things uh, I find remarkable is how many contributions were made by interlopers. How many great discoveries were made by people who were on the margins of the field. Uh, at Princeton, I worked very closely for many years with Danny Kahneman, a Nobel Prize winner in economics who comes from psychology. Um, I, I've been reading a book called The Ideas Factory about the history of Bell Labs, which shows a remarkable history of discoveries at Bell Labs, including the semiconductor, the first communication satellite, um, uh, broadcast television, uh, the ability to broadcast uh, images uh, for television uh, from, from Bell Labs, uh, computer algorithms. Uh, a great many of the innovations came from people uh, who were in other fields. And I think it's this culture of openness uh, that helps to invigorate the American system of higher education. And it's not only our four-year colleges and postgraduate universities that are the backbone of higher education in the US and the post-secondary training, but our system of community colleges is also a strength. This is a unique system that provides access to all who want to pursue higher education. More than 35% a first-time college freshman enroll at a community college. Research has found that students who complete a year of credit at a community college increase their earnings by 5 to 8 percent, which is about the same magnitude uh, as the earnings gain associated with attending a four-year college. The community college system in the U.S. is evidence that there are many avenues to success in a higher education in the U.S. And I remember many of my classmates when I was at Cornell had transferred in from the community college system. <coughs> President Obama has proposed to leverage the system to build on our strengths. Uh, first, he has set as a goal that the U.S. will have the largest share of college-educated adults in the world by 2020. We've slipped in our leadership. In the U.S., we have the highest uh, educated, the highest share of the population with a college degree for 60-year-olds of any country in the world, but when it comes to 30-year-olds, uh, uh, we're towards the middle of the OECD. Uh, one of the reasons why the U.S., uh, I think, faced stagnant incomes for the middle class is that our educational attainment failed to keep up with many other countries. <coughs> The president has put forward several policies to help increase financial uh, access and college readiness. Uh, these include the American Opportunities Tax Credit, which is a tax credit worth up to $10,000 to help families send their children for four years of college. We have also greatly increased the generosity and number of Pell Grants, uh, which are grants that enable uh, students from less advantaged families to go to college. Um, and the president has proposed an $8 billion fund for community colleges to help community colleges partner with companies in the area to help develop curriculum and uh, to help train workers for jobs that are available in the area. The fifth item on my list for confidence in the U.S. economy is that we have an entrepreneurial culture. And this entrepreneurial culture is supported by a vibrant venture capital community. It should be no surprise that the MBA degree, Masters of Business Administration, was invented in the US. It is surprising, however, 
that it took over 40 years for schools in other countries to start issuing MBA degrees. The U.S. has always had the most daring entrepreneurs, and we have a market, education system, and culture that encourages entrepreneurship. Some of the storied U.S. entrepreneurs include Steve Jobs, Jerry Yang, Jeff Bezos, Vera Wang, Warren Buffett, Howard Schultz, started Starbucks, Walt Disney, Henry Ford, Ben Franklin, and Oprah Winfrey. It is startup entrepreneurs like these that drive a substantial share of job creation in the U.S. Research by John Holtewanger and co-authors has found that startups are a key component of job growth. Let me give you uh, one illustration of this. Take 2005, which is kind of a normal year in the U.S. Startup companies created three, three and a half million jobs in the U.S. in 2005. In that same year, net job growth was two and a half million. So what that means is outside of the startups, everyone else on net was shrinking. And that's not unusual. We find that when we look at other years as well. The Obama administration has taken findings like these to heart and have created a number of initiatives to try to encourage startups. We call this Startup America. Uh, components of, of Startup America include providing more access to capital for high growth companies. Uh, Congress recently passed something called the Jobs Act. This is an example, uh, contrary to uh, most of what you read in the paper, where the administration and Congress work together, bipartisan bill to help provide access to more capital for smaller businesses, to reduce uh, some uh, uh, regulatory filing requirements for, uh, for small companies uh, that are starting up, to provide for crowdfunding, to uh, encourage more investment in small businesses. We're also pursuing ways to connect entrepreneurs with mentors, <laughs> to reduce government barriers for startup companies, to accelerate innovation from the lab to the market for federally funded research and development, and to unleash market opportunities in industries like healthcare, clean energy, and learning technologies. And I expect that this entrepreneurial culture uh, will continue in the US. And in fact, if you go back to some of the darkest days of our economy in the Great Depression, it's impressive how many of the major corporations that are still around were started in that period. Sixth on my list, don't worry, it's only seven. It's a safe bet that the US will continue to have a highly productive and innovative economy. Innovation, as you know, comes in two basic forms. There's product innovation and process innovation. We innovate by creating new products spurred by the rewards of having an opportunity to succeed in the largest economy in the world. <clears throat> we also innovate by figuring out ways to make the things we already make with fewer resources. This raises productivity. Our living standards increase from both forms of innovation. In America, we admire the great inventors of our times, and we marvel at their new technologies. This is a lesson I learned very early. I remember when I was in elementary school, we went on a class trip in New Jersey to visit the Thomas Alva Edison Laboratory in Menlo Park. And uh, I actually have this vivid memory of seeing his old roll top desk, which had a whole bunch of papers stuck in it, thinking to myself, we ought to take out the papers and see what else he was thinking about. Because the inventions that came from Edison's laboratory truly changed the world. He had almost 1,100 patents in his lifetime, and these included patents for the light bulb, the electric motor, the phonograph, the motion picture camera, the full duplex telegraph, and the alkaline battery. Think for a moment about how these inventions boosted the economy. They created new and better jobs and improved the quality of life in America and around the world. The electric motor, to take one example, reduced the burden of lifting and carrying heavy objects, and it helped all types of businesses to increase their productivity. With the light bulb and electricity, 
Factories could run multiple shifts and produce more output for the world to consume with the same amount of capital investment. This also created an entirely new industry to generate electricity uh, and, and, and provide it. The telegraph increased the speed at which people could send and receive information. And obviously there have been tremendous advances uh, since then. Uh, the motion picture and phonograph made it possible for people to enjoy the leisure time that was freed up as a result of economic growth and productivity growth. Now I have to say, uh, the US does not have a monopoly in such innovations. And I was a bit humbled because yesterday I had the opportunity to visit the uh, National Technical Museum here in Prague. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the feeling of deja vu because I visited the Ford Museum in Detroit. And, and you look at the cars that were built in 1900, 1910, uh, and you really have tremendous respect for the uh, innovations that helped to make us uh, live in a better world. Um, I was struck visiting the museum at the motorcycles that were uh, uh, invented here, here in the uh, Czech Republic or back then in Czechoslovakia uh, and how modern they looked. Uh, and it's also striking in terms of how things can go awry uh, when you don't see innovations after 1950 uh, and how important it is uh, to organize economies in ways uh, that encourage uh, development of uh, new products. In the U.S., Menlo Park, California, has become a, a, a popular locus of innovation in the century since Edison developed the phonograph in Menlo Park, New Jersey. But the lessons, the lessons from Edison's laboratory still resonate. If I look at my home state of New Jersey, there are legions of employees who are working in industries that were established due to Edison's innovations. Edison's cutting edge inventions attracted and supported other related innovative activities. Bell Labs, which I alluded to earlier, was based in New Jersey. One thing that we've learned from research over the last decade or so is that innovative activity often takes place in clusters or hubs. Another example in the US is the Research Triangle area in North Carolina. In recognition of the importance of the spillover effects, for the whole economy that accrue from clusters of innovative activity, the Obama administration requested funds for regional innovation clusters back in our 2011 budget. And in the president's latest budget, he asked for funds to create up to 13 uh, institutes of manufacturing innovation, which would connect research centers with uh, factories, with community colleges to help train workers uh, to develop innovative manufacturing products. Uh, and the president used existing funds from the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense to create a competition for the first of these innovative uh, manufacturing hubs. And I think of these as based on the Bell Labs model. Uh, at Bell Labs, the scientists worked the, walked the factory floor, floors uh, to learn uh, how to improve productivity, how to make better products. And these complementarities are often missed in our economic models. Now back to uh, reasons for confidence in the U.S. economy. U.S. companies invest more in research and development than do private companies in the next highest three countries combined. <clears throat> that is, we invest more in research and development than the sum total of China, Japan, and Germany. This is a key ingredient for our economic growth. But economists have long recognized that the incentives provided by the private market to invest in innovation are not sufficient. And this is also reflected in our policies. The private market alone underprovides investment in innovation because the returns accrue to more people than the investors alone. This is a classic positive externality. This is particularly the case for basic science. Government investments have been critical for spurring innovation and economic growth. together with private sector investments. The US government invests a greater percentage of GDP in R&D than does the government in any other OECD country. Many products are a result of federally funded research. Prominent examples include the internet, which is a result of funding from the Defense Department. 
GPS, the global positioning system, which many of you probably have on your phones, and the sequencing of the human genome. President Obama has called for a ramp up in R&D expenditures to 3% of GDP when private and public investments are combined. That's a higher rate than was the case during the space race. In addition, the president has taken steps to accelerate the commercialization or lab to market phase of development. And in September, the president signed the America Invents Act, which will provide more secure funding for the Patent and Trademark Office, reduce the backlog of applications for patents, and improve patent quality. These steps, together with our strong educational system, our research clusters, and competitive marketplace will ensure that the U.S. Is an, is an innovative economy for years to come. In his speech in Osawatomie, Kansas, President Obama noted, the world is shifting to an innovation economy and nobody does innovation better than America. No one has better colleges. Nobody has better universities. Nobody has a greater diversity of talent and ingenuity. No one's workers or entrepreneurs are more driven or more daring. The things that have always been our strengths match up perfectly with the demands of the moment. Lastly on my list, we in the U.S. are a resourceful, results-oriented people. And we have the capability to continually reinvent ourselves and to pursue solutions that solve our problems. Winston Churchill is believed to have said, there's actually not all that much documentation that he actually said it, but Churchill reportedly said, you can always count on the Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. Now there are two ways to interpret this quote. One, which is probably what Churchill had in mind, is that the answers to our problems are clear from the outset, and that in America, we go down many roads before we choose the one that we should have started with. There's a second interpretation which I prefer, and that is that the solution to many of our problems may not be as clear cut as many people think they are at the outset. But our system leads us to try lots of things. We Americans experiment a lot. We are particularly good at shaking off setbacks and being persistent as we strive to improve ourselves. We are pragmatic. Once we find something that works, we settle on it. To use terms that I probably learned from Jan Kementa's book, we are Bayesians. We learn from the past and continue to try new things until we get it right. Our optimistic sense that we can solve our problems by pursuing a pragmatic approach is an enduring characteristic of our nation. So let me conclude by saying a little bit more about the current economic situation. The US economy has expanded for nearly three years. The pace of economic growth and job growth has not been fast enough to fill the deep hole that was caused by the financial crisis and severe recession that followed. The economic challenges that we face in the U.S. are the direct result of problems that took years to build up and then came to a boil during the financial crisis and economic crisis in 2007 through 2009. We are still recovering from that profound crisis and the problems that led to it. Because middle class incomes failed to keep up with inflation, families borrowed to support their consumption and buy homes that later fell in value. Families are now paying down debt, which is restraining consumption and economic growth. Meanwhile, because we overbuilt homes, builders have been reluctant to build new homes, and construction workers face unemployment rates of around 15%. The government budget moved from surplus and paying down debt at the end of the 1990s to deficit and exploding debt in the early 2000s because the priorities in, the, in Washington at that time shifted to increased spending to prosecute two wars while cutting taxes, particularly for the most advantaged 
in American society. We are now confronting these problems and recovering while we are facing down the extraordinary support that the government provided for the economy in the immediate aftermath of the crisis. We are going through a period of austerity in the US. State and local government has been declining and this recovery is unprecedented in modern times in America where we have the state and local government contracting while the economy is expanding. The federal government has also begun to reduce its footprint in the economy and will continue to do so as Recovery Act funds continue to phase out and other measures like the payroll tax cut phase out. It's actually remarkable when we look at the data and see that in the Reagan and Bush years, government spending supported the recoveries and in the Clinton and Obama years, government spending uh, has, uh, has been declining and has been a headwind for recovery. It's not the typical view that people have uh, of uh, those presidents, but it is in fact uh, the case that military Keynesianism helped to boost the Reagan recovery. Continuing the recovery and addressing these problems that led to the crisis are the main economic challenges that the U.S. now faces. Not uncertainty about economic policies or regulations. To an economist, the solution to these problems is clear. We need to raise demand for our goods and services in the short run and repair the housing market while we strengthen and sustain the economic recovery and put more people back to work. We should also pursue credible, enforceable policies that put us on a fiscally sustainable path in the intermediate term and long term. And we need to maintain our investments in innovation, research, education, and infrastructure. The President has proposed exactly this type of strategy. In his latest budget, he proposed to Congress a balanced plan that would increase demand in the short run while decreasing the deficit in the 10-year budget window. <coughs> it is this type of balanced approach that is needed to build a path towards fiscal sustainability. Uncertainty cannot be an excuse for inaction. Even in an uncertain world, I have emphasized that there are considerable strengths that you can count on to continue in the U.S. economy. Chiefly our large free market economy, our stable economic institutions, our culture and entrepreneurial spirit, our skilled workforce, and our ingenuity. I firmly believe that there is no amount of uncertainty that we cannot, that we cannot conquer in America by relying on the durable strengths of what is certain in America. With that, I'm happy to take questions, and I hope the whole panel will also be able to respond to questions. I think we're a small enough room that we don't need to pass the microphone around for questions. And uh, we'll encourage uh, folks to uh, stand up and, um, and ask your questions. And don't be shy. Okay. I ask you, what is the survival rate of the startups? Because I believe, what is the survival rate of the startups? Because I believe Certainly, related to the startups as well. So the jobs may leverage, let's say, than those of established firms. Uh, <coughs> That's an excellent question. Um, the uh, survival rate is low for startups, and um, an important feature of the U.S. economy is our dynamism. We have uh, many new entrants. Um, and opportunity for success. We have, a, um, Ambassador Eisen brought a copy of the economic report of the president, and one of, one of my duties on my job is to have the, the lead the Council of Economic Advisors in producing the economic report of the president. I vowed that we would make it thinner, but I didn't succeed. Uh, and we have a whole chapter in here on exactly that issue, on uh, the vitality 
of the U.S. economy, on the dynamism, on the startups and failures. Um, I think that the strength that we have, and uh, 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 two other points related to this issue. Uh, one is having a strong safety net actually supports having an entrepreneurial economy, having a dynamic economy. Because if entrepreneurs fail, they can take advantage of the safety net. The safety net will prop them up, will help them get on their feet so they can start another venture. So uh, having a, a safety net, I think, is um, complementary to having an innovative, dynamic economy. And the fact that under President Obama, we've strengthened our safety net, uh, we've modernized our unemployment insurance system, um, which will now also help to support people to become self-employed. Uh, we have expanded uh, access to health insurance and, and uh, will uh, are, are in the process of setting up exchanges which entrepreneurs will be able to use to get access to the health insurance at rates similar to large companies. Um, uh, this, I think, will actually help our, our, our entrepreneurial culture. Uh, I would uh, also add that even before the recession in the 2000s, the, 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 the uh, vitality of the U.S. economy was showing signs of weakening. And the startup rate uh, had been falling. Some of that, I think, is related to demographics. As the U.S. has gotten older, um, it tends to be younger people who start new companies. Not only young people. I'd say Jeff Bezos told me he thinks the best strategy, or at least the strategy that worked for him, was to work for 10 years for a corporation and learn things before he started his own. Uh, but all, he also emphasized for all kinds of models. That's not the model that works for everyone. Um, but I think that uh, we need to be aware in the U.S. that over the last decade, uh, we've become somewhat less than we had been. And that's why I think it's so important that the administration has made increasing the number of startups a priority. Um, I should also mention when we look at the U.S. economy and kind of think about the future, uh, even though we are uh, aging in the U.S., uh, we're aging more slowly than the rest of the world. You know, if you look at the demographic patterns, China is going to get a lot older faster. One of the consequences of the one-child policy is that their age structure uh, uh, is such that the uh, number of uh, uh, working age people uh, relative to very young or those who are retirement years uh, is going to shrink pretty rapidly. So uh, another reason not on my list for confidence in the U.S. economy is that compared to the rest of the world, we're going to continue to be usable, even as Norm and I, who are at the, the heart of the baby room, the edge of the baby room, uh, get older. Well, at least we're aging together. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be a great tourism slogan for the United States. Move to the United States, you'll age more slowly. <laughs> uh, I would just add that uh, part of President Obama's uh, dynamism, everybody can hear me okay, right? You can hear me in the back. Part of the dynamism has been to, to be flexible even about his and our most strongly held principles. So he recently signed legislation uh, relaxing some of the regulatory requirements for startups. The startups complain. Some of those are the same regulatory requirements we had worked on. The startups complain that it was placing an additional burden on them. The president is not doctrinaire nor his top team about this, and so relax those those requirements with the requirements to kick in later on as the companies <coughs> grow and take off. There was something interesting in the check press this morning about, on your point about failures, about the learning power of failures. And I do not, just to emphasize uh, what Alan says, part of the strength of the American economy, and it helps if you have a safety net so you bounce back up instead of crashing to the ground, Part of the strength is that there is room to fail. And that is a very important, uh, I think that is what Winston Churchill meant. And that is a very important feature of our economy and of our mindset, uh, that those entrepreneurs who don't ever succeed uh, try, try again. Uh, and what I read this morning in the press, I think, was that recruiters here now are starting, I think it was semi-sarcastic, but are starting to look at the history, and it turns out that some of the best learning experiences that our um, leaders have had are their failures. I know that's been personally true for me. That is where you where you learn the most. So it's a so the mortality rate of startups is a two-edged sword, at least in the U.S. economy. 
And then before I pass down to, uh, uh, to Young, um, the final point I would make is that um, I worry a lot about, uh, about how we can um, share these, these lessons from our economy, also learn from the experiences of the Czech economy and the Czech entrepreneurs, and many of the same criteria Alan, that, that describe why the, the seven points that uh, uh, establish your vision of why the U.S. economy uh, is, so we have reasons to be optimistic about the U.S. economy. I think the same is true about the bilateral relationship between the Czech Republic and the United States, that in my interactions with researchers and developers and technicians and entrepreneurs, and business leaders in both countries, including as they speak to each other, our relationship as two countries has this same dynamism to it. So maybe we'll reflect on that more, uh, more as we move through. But I think your testimony here as a part of your, your long relationship with Surge uh, speaks to this exceptionally dynamic relationship between our two our two countries, and we're trying to do even more. Honeywell, in the past month alone, I visited Honeywell's research center here in Brno, where they have uh, had so much innovation. It's a bilateral Czech-US success story. I just had a visit from IBM senior executives from all over the world who want to do more uh, with their presence. They have a big presence in the Czech Republic, very dynamic, very innovative. Uh, the Mayo Clinic. I went to the site where the Mayo Clinic is going to open uh, a, uh, a joint uh, venture uh, in the Czech Republic. So people are noticing that, uh, that the Czech Republic is a good place to expand uh, this vision of dynamic uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. Yeah, I well, can just say, I, I, uh, <coughs> I, my personal you know, experience is a very good example of that. I, uh, was ejected or left uh, here when I was 17. <coughs> Basically finished high school except for one thing, I didn't have the final diploma. And I applied all over Europe and uh, all the universities wrote back and said, we fully understand you're a special case. But we will take it. Can't take it without that diploma. So I applied to uh, a couple of American schools and they said something like, well, we don't understand your case at all. But uh, why don't you come as a special student? You know, for a year, if you can handle it, fine. You know, you can become a regular student, go to all your courses and the credit, and if not, it's going to be a good experience for you. Mm -hmm. I think you know, that really sort of sums it up in terms of historically the willingness to experiment at all levels. And I think uh, you know it still is the case. I'm sure it's catching up in some respects and so on. But the American flexibility, willingness to experiment, and providing the supporting institutions. One that I think is important that was implicit in what uh, you said is personal, the ease of personal bankruptcy. That you can re emerge. You, know, you can fail and re emerge. You don't become an indentured servant and have to repay forever for life, whatever you owe. And, uh, it's, you know, perhaps too easy, some people are. But nevertheless, it's very consistent. Uh, if I may, let me try to build on Young's experience. Uh, just last week, we had a very interesting paper presented in our seminar series, which showed that the U.S. Uh, actually is attracting the most talented people for its graduate programs. The example is based on, on research in chemistry, and, or slash biology, and it shows that students from China, who now constitute about 30, 40 percent of all graduate students in chemistry in the, in the U.S. and at the Ph.D. level, that they're actually more productive relative to the typical student to a degree which is similar to the productivity gap which you would have between Americans who qualify for National Science Foundation fellowships and the typical Americans you know, and who end up in these programs. So that kind of shows how you, you know, how the US, thanks to its high quality universities, a model which we're trying to emulate here, uh, has been able to uh, continuously attract talent from all over the world. But I'd like to turn that into perhaps a question for Alan in the sense that, well, that's, that's the uh, graduate programs. But what about the undergraduate programs and the rising costs in the U.S.? And in particular, if you, you, know, if you could maybe comment on which of the uh, uh, measures that you've you listed, the recent checklist, et cetera, might help to 
uh, fight the increasing inequality, an issue which you highlighted yourself recently, and in particular, you know, the, the plausible self-reinforcing nature of inequality, where maybe the more advantage or better prepared to deal with the uh, effects of uncertainty. Well, I am very concerned that the rise in inequality that we've had in the U.S. that is going to lead to um, a reduction in opportunity for social mobility. That uh, because we see the top do so much better in four way uh, from the middle and the bottom, and the bottom do so poorly in the eighties, that uh, children born to uh, disadvantaged parents don't have anything like the opportunities for. Uh, economic mobility of children who are in the top. Uh, I think the clearest solution involves education and access to education. The, uh, and th there's bipartisan agreement about that. George Schultz had an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal last week uh, where he uh, argued about the importance of improving our educational system for our economy. Um, so the president has uh, focused on the whole education system, K through 12, uh, Education Secretary Duncan has led a program called Race to the Top, which um, has uh, used incentives, provides a fund for states to compete for, uh, and they need to uh, select um, uh, scientifically evaluated programs um, <coughs> to, um, uh, to use to improve their education systems to get access to this money. Um, We've also been trying to increase access to pre <coughs> uh, the Head Start program, for example, which, which uh, Jim Heckman and other economists have found had pretty high payoff. Um, that's uh, at the uh, high school and below level. I think a lot of our problems arise post, post high school, in part because it's free up until, up until college. And uh, Pell Grants, which I mentioned, are an important tool. Um, the American Opportunity Tax Credit, especially for middle class families, there are savings programs. It's difficult for people to save. I mean, it's, um, the, the, the savings programs are not utilized as much as they should be. They're utilized by wealthy families, but not middle class families. Uh, Section 529 savings accounts. Um, and uh, we, we've tried to do more to increase uh, awareness of, of those savings programs because the middle class would benefit. Um, but let me also mention student loans. Uh, to economists, student loans are an extremely important tool for increasing access to higher education because higher education should raise people's lifetime income prospects. They're temporarily poor, they face uh, a liquidity constraint, if you put it that way. Student loan helps to bridge that. Uh, the president uh, has, uh, the president who he himself had student loans and didn't pay them all until a long ago. Um, I also have student loans, by the way. So, so it, it, it's a tool which is you know, widely used in the U.S. Uh, the system had really gotten out of whack. The uh, fees were, I think, higher than what was necessary. So we had direct lending uh, to try to cut out the, uh, the banks in the middle. And, and uh, the president has been urging Congress to act quickly because interest rates on uh, new student loans will double if Congress doesn't extend the low rates that were passed previously uh, by, uh, by the end of June, I think it is. Um, it's also interesting because student loans have helped families now while they face credit constraints. And we've seen a big increase in student loans, which I suspect is helping not only to help people get more human capital, but also supporting consumption and recovery. Um, and it's uh, you know, lower cost than using credit cards. So we now have more student loan debt than we have credit card debt. Because one's gone up and the other's gone down. Um, but to the extent that it increases educational attainment, I think it's, it's, a, it's a positive development. Uh, you also asked a little bit, I think, about uh, undergraduate education and foreign students. One of the changes in US higher education that I think you'll see is that we more foreign students, not only in graduate programs, but also in undergraduate programs. Um, and I think that that will, will gradually take place, but I think that uh, as universities seem to have, seek to have more diversity and as they want to prepare for a more global world, they're going to look for the most talented undergraduates to, to attract.
All right, let's, we have a question all the way in the back row. Stand up. Uh, good afternoon. I would just like to ask, uh, it is a very broad issue, but about Europe, if you see it so often as, as the U.S., what's your vision? Thank you. Uh, Europe is very important to the U.S. Uh, see, I can be the best. Europe is our largest trading partner. 20% of our exports go to Europe. Our relationship with Europe is much deeper than our economic ties, but our economic ties are also important. Um, apart from trade, goods, and services, the financial links are also extremely important. Um, so the Economic difficulties in Europe have an effect on us in the U.S. Uh, and um, we're particularly focused on um, the financial situation in Europe, the sovereign debt, and the banking crisis. My, my former boss, Secretary Weber, was uh, uh, very actively involved in uh, helping European authorities consider different solutions. Um, we believe that the lessons that we learned from our own financial crisis, and nobody knows those lessons better than Secretary Geiger, could be of help uh, to uh, the European financial authorities. Um, I think Europe has made a lot of progress. I think we often forget about the uh, progress that's been made with the, um, the, uh, the, the firewall, with the fiscal compact, um, the LTRO, which had a very positive effect in terms of interest rates in Spain and Italy and other countries. Um, we continue to believe that the European authorities have the capability to address uh, their problems and uh, we stand ready to provide assistance when we think, uh, think that that kind of advice can be helpful. Um, and um, uh, I suspect that the problems in Europe are going to require creative solutions. Uh, more work needs to be done. Um, and we are at a fragile, fragile point, uh, but I think it is still the case where the right policy steps uh, will uh, enable uh, Europe to get, to get ahead of the financial situation. Uh, I would only add to that that the, we have welcomed the emphasis uh, here in the Czech Republic on boosting exports and on targeting uh, a set of markets for increased economic ties. That's a two-way street, of course. Uh, and the United States is one of those target economies. We had a very interesting lunch in which we talked about uh, the model that we worked out jointly with our Czech colleagues uh, in government, uh, in the opposition, uh, the Czech academic sector, uh, the embassy where we really focused on the message of the importance of exports. We've had personal high-level leadership to bring companies together to boost exports, um, including uh, I've accompanied two delegations of business people to the United <coughs> States and literally have personally introduced them to their potential American trading partners. Uh, the importance of value-added innovation based exports to both countries, so uh, our big <coughs> FDI here, U.S. FDI, uh, in the Czech Republic is over, uh, estimated to, to be worth over five billion and is, uh, uh, the, according to Czech uh, government statistics, the second lar largest source of job creation uh, in the Czech Republic. The emphasis on having a level playing field, so exporters in both countries Alan talked about the importance of our American institutions and of rule of law, and of course I talk about that a lot um, uh, in terms of having good governance and, uh, and fighting back against corruption. Um, uh, all of these uh, are elements uh, in, in, the, in the model of boosting exports that we think can be helpful to both countries as we emerge. The United States is probably a little bit ahead of the curve uh, on emerging from our economic crisis. We do think the lessons learned are valuable, but it's not just an academic issue. We need to roll up our sleeves and really go to work to make sure that economies are thriving in both places. And we've been very privileged in embassy fraud to help us. And in fact, Czech exports to the United States have gone up dramatically over the course of the past year. So that's our practical contribution to help him uh, resolve the situation. I think you're fortunate in the Czech Republic there are uh, 
uh, many countries in Europe that would uh, trade places with you uh, in terms of the, uh, the overall economic health, although growth remains a priority, I think, everywhere. Well, thank you very much, both of you, all of you, for coming. And let's give one more round of applause to both of you.